Hi, I'm Sean Duggan, and welcome back to another episode of The Fix, the podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and all the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. In this episode, we're going to be kicking the tires, metaphorically speaking, that is, on the latest update to Photoshop CC. So let me go get my tire-kicking boots on, and I'll catch up with you in a second. Well, thanks for tuning in and joining me. I hope that wherever you are in the world, the pixels are treating you well. And speaking of pixels, we have uh, an update to uh, one of our favorite pixel pushing programs this week, and that is Photoshop CC 2015.1. The update came out on December 1st. Uh, so that was just earlier this week here as I record this now. And what I want to do in this episode is uh, um, kind of check it out and take a look at some of my my favorite new features and improvements. I'm not going to be looking at everything uh, in the update. Um, I'm mainly going to be concentrating on the features that I think are going to be of the most interest to photographers. Um, and the whole kind of term or, or concept of kicking the tires, that actually harkens back to uh, my predecessor on this program and the original founding host, Jan Kabili. She actually did a show uh, earlier in the year uh, for a, an earlier update to Photoshop, and she called it kicking the tires. So I felt that that was actually a pretty good um, concept there to describe what we're going to do. We're just going to kind of go out, kick the tires, see what we think about it maybe take it for a test drive and check out some of the new features and see what we think. So without further ado, let's dive in to the latest version of Photoshop and start kicking tires. So one of the first things, I guess the first thing you're going to notice after seeing the different splash screen there, is this new start screen in Photoshop. So of course, uh, if you've been using Photoshop for a while, you know that in times past, whenever you open up the program, you would just see the Photoshop interface. You would see the tool panel and the options bar and the various uh, other panels on the uh, the right-hand side of the interface if you had your interface set up using the default configuration. And now we have this, um, this start screen that allows us access to our recent files, our libraries, and our presets. Now let me clarify here that you're only going to see the thumbnails of recently opened files, uh, as you can see here, uh, only after you have opened those files up into this new version of Photoshop. So if you're just opening this up from the, for the very first time um, after upgrading, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, kind of these blank generic thumbnails uh, of your recently opened files. Uh, or if you're viewing it in list mode, which you can get to by clicking on this little list icon here at the top, you will see a list of the file names but you'll only see the thumbnails uh, once you've opened them up into this new version of Photoshop. So in addition to seeing our recent files, uh, we can also uh, choose libraries. And if you've created any libraries in Photoshop and want to open up elements from them, you could do so. For example, I have here a library that contains uh, elements associated with my logo. So I could come over here and click on that and open that up. And I can also choose to open up a new file based on um, kind of common presets that are baked into this version of Photoshop. So you can see we have uh, presets for print documents, web documents, uh, mobile app design docs, uh, film and video, etc. If you wanted to open up the kind of familiar new file dialog, which you're probably used to. You can just click on new or choose command N. And that brings up this um, updated version of the new file dialog, updated with the new uh, spectrum interface design. I'm just going to cancel that. You can also get to that by choosing custom document down below here. And you see we get to that same dialog. Or you can just click on the open button and that's going to bring up a standard open dialog that uh, you're used to. And since that is going to be your operating system uh, dialog, that's going to look, you know, the same. And at the bottom here are shortcuts to uh, the Adobe stock. 
service and uh, shortcuts to uh, various uh, videos and libraries that are out there on the web. Now, I imagine that not everybody is going to be really thrilled with this new start screen here. Uh, certainly, it's, it's pretty useful, I guess, if you want to have access to files you have been working on. Uh, but if you'd rather have it return to the previous behavior, the legacy behavior, the way that Photoshop behaved in the past, uh, there is a way you can turn that off. And your first hint of that is this little gear icon here up in the upper right. And whenever I see a gear icon in software, that kind of suggests to me that this is a place where I can make changes, like a shortcut to preferences or something. And if I go into it here, I can see that it definitely does refer to hiding the start workspace, but it doesn't allow me to make any changes here. It just kind of tells me where I have to go to do it. So it tells me I have to go to the preferences to change that. You know, I kind of regard that as a user interface fail uh, on Adobe's part here. Uh, and if not a fail, then certainly just a, a kind of a lazy tease. Because if you're going to show a gear icon, in my opinion, which is sort of you know near universal in software um, to indicate that this is a place where you can make changes or access the preferences. If you're going to show a gear icon, you should allow people to make a change there. Uh, or at the very least, what they should have here is a button that would take me to the preferences. Instead, I kind of have to go all the way over and, and open up the preferences um, on a Mac that would be here in the Photoshop menu. And of course, in Windows, that would be in the edit menu. And I might as well go there now and turn that off. So here is this uh, checkbox preference right here. Show start workspace when no documents are open. I will turn that off. Now down below, there's a, a similar preference here that says show recent files workspace when opening a file. So I'm going to leave that on just so we can see what that looks like. By the way, the shortcut for accessing the preferences is Command K on a Mac or Control K on Windows. I'll just click OK there. And while I'm here, I might as well click on a file to bring that into Photoshop. And now if I chose Command O to open up a new file, here is what that other preference is going to do. It's going to show the recent files workspace over here on the side. So you can see I have the access to my recent files and I can view those either in the thumbnail view, which we have here, or um, in list view. I can choose open or new. Uh, from these buttons at the top here. And again, uh, here again is this tease up here at the top, the, the little gear icon, which uh, doesn't really allow you to change anything. It just tells you how to go and change it. I'm just going to tap on close here to close that recent files dialog. And let's move on to the next cool thing about this version of Photoshop, and that would be customizable toolbars. So if I come over here to the bottom of the tool panel here, or the toolbar, you can see that there's this little ellipse down at the bottom, these three dots that are you know, just below the zoom tool and just above the foreground background colors. If I click and hold there, you'll see it says edit toolbar. So let's open that up and, and take a look at that. So the way that this works is you can uh, customize your toolbars simply by dragging and dropping tools out of the toolbar section here over onto the right into the extra tools section. So for instance, um, you know, I'd never use the single row marquee or single column marquee. Let's get rid of those. Um, and the artboard tool, uh, I, I might play around with that, but you know, for now I'm not going to use that. So I'll, I'll get rid of that. Now, one thing you can do is you can move entire sections here out of the, um, of the toolbar. So let's find a section that I want to remove here. Um, well, let's take the um, the blur, sharpen, and smudge tool. If I want to get the entire section out, notice that if I hover over a tool, that tool is highlighted in blue. But if I move my mouse up a little bit, or rather my cursor up, I should say, it then highlights the entire section. Then I can just, well, it's very kind of touchy here. Then I can grab that whole section, there we go, and take that out. Now, another thing that you can do here, which is pretty useful, is that you can change the shortcuts. You'll see that the shortcuts are listed here, and if I just click on that, it highlights, and I could choose a new shortcut. So for instance, I got the rectangular marquee tool selected. I can just choose A, and then 
I've changed that shortcut. So now A is going to be my shortcut for the rectangular marquee tool. Now, of course, that makes no sense at all. So uh, I am going to set that back to M. Now, there's an interesting little um, option down here at the bottom that says disable shortcuts for hidden toolbar extras. What that means is if there's already a shortcut associated with um, a tool, but that tool is kind of stashed over here in extra tools, you can take that shortcut and uh, assign it to a, a new tool. At the bottom are buttons here that allow you to uh, hide or show uh, certain elements here. I can uh, hide the quick mask. I can hide the foreground and background colors if I want to. Uh, things like that. I am going to actually turn those on just because I'd like to have those on. Now, if you go really crazy, you can make tool bars and tool sets that are specific to certain types of work that you're doing and save them as a preset. So, for instance, I'm going to click on load preset here, and I actually have a toolbar that I've already saved called Super Minimal Smudge. And there we have it. You can see over there in the toolbar, I only have one tool, the incredibly useful smudge tool. So uh, th that's for those times when I just kind of want to zen out and open a document and only use the smudge tool there. But I'm actually going to set that back to restore default here and click on cancel just to get out of here. Now, by the way, you can access that customized toolbar dialog not only by clicking down here on this little ellipse uh, down at the bottom of the tools, but also by coming up to the edit menu and then you can just choose edit toolbar and that'll bring up that same dialog. So let's move over to Adobe Camera Raw next because there's an interesting improvement that's been added there. So I'll open up a raw file. And actually, the first thing I'm going to do here uh, really doesn't pertain to anything that's new, but it's I'm just going to do it because I can't stand it, and that is to straighten this file out. So I'll just click on the little level tool up here in the toolbar and just drag over that crooked horizon there to level this out. Double click in the bounding box, and now the picture is leveled, and I'm happy, and I can continue with the podcast without going crazy. All right, this version of Camera Raw, which is uh, Camera Raw 9.3, uh, has the usual uh, additions of new cameras that have been added, uh, as well as new lens profiles. I'm not going to go into all of those here in detail in this recording, uh, but I will put a link in the show notes uh, for this podcast that takes you to the official Adobe announcement, which is going to list uh, the cameras and the lenses that are now supported in Camera Raw. And you can find that at thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix and just go find, you know, this most recent episode. The biggest thing in this new version of Adobe Camera Raw that was released with Photoshop CC 2015.1 is the addition of the dehaze slider to local adjustments. Now, this was added to Lightroom earlier in the fall with the uh, October early October 2015 release uh, of Lightroom. So it's been in Lightroom now for a um, little over uh, two months, uh, but now we have it in Adobe Camera Raw. And so the way that that works is I'll come up here to my adjustment brush in the tools up in the top left part of the Camera Raw dialog. And I'm gonna come over here to the dehaze slider and move that up a little bit. And of course, this is a a uh, coastal shot here, and oftentimes uh, we do get uh, haze uh, in coastal shots like this. Although, of course, haze does show up in a lot of other types of pictures. I'll just click there and brush over that area there on the hill in the distance and cut the haze down. Maybe even come over the water here a little bit. And that's, you know, looking a lot better there. Uh, let me just turn that up a little bit more, perhaps. Now, of course, the other thing you can do with haze, or, or rather dehaze, is you can add haze uh, to a scene. So I can, you know, make it look a lot hazier, which can, could look interesting on some pictures. But I think for this one, I'm just going to leave that um, set to uh, more of a plus value there. And I think that that is uh, working pretty good. Let's come back and click on the uh, zoom tool here to exit out of the adjustment brush functionality. So that's certainly a welcome addition to the local adjustment tools in Camera Raw. And that's going to work with the adjustment brush, 
the uh, graduated filter and the radial filter. Another new feature in Camera Raw for this release of Photoshop is the addition of the bird's eye view functionality. And this actually is something that's been in Photoshop for a while, although admittedly it is a somewhat of a lesser known feature. But what it allows you to do is define an area that you want to zoom into to get to 100% and then easily kind of come back out and navigate around to another area and then instantly snap back to 100% view in that area. So the way it works is, uh, no matter what tool you happen to have active, you want to hold down the H key on the keyboard, keep it held down, and click on a part of the image that you want to zoom into. And you can see here that I'm now into 100%. And then if I hold down H again and click and hold with the mouse button or the trackpad button, it zooms me back out, but I can see the uh, bounding box there, the little rectangle defining what that 100% view is. And I can actually drag that and move that somewhere else. And then when I let go of the mouse button, it zooms me back in to uh, that view so I can uh, inspect critical focus or maybe uh, look for areas that I need to spot or something like that. And of course, uh, a really useful shortcut for getting back to the uh, fit image in view mode is to double click on the hand tool. And then if you double click on the zoom tool, that will bring you back up to 100% view. And those are shortcuts that also work exactly the same out in uh, the rest of Photoshop. The other thing that's received some upgrades in this new version of Photoshop is the libraries panel. Now, I really don't use libraries too much, but for some things, they actually do come in uh, pretty handy, such as working with uh, common uh, text or graphic elements that you tend to use over and over and over again, whether that would be your logo uh, or you know some of your self-promotional pieces. A lot of photographers you know, do use Photoshop to create their own uh, promotional material. And on that note, I have a file that I've been working on for some promotional graphics for my upcoming winter landscapes and auroras workshop in Iceland. So let me actually open that file up. And when you open up a file that has elements like text and styles and character styles and things like that, this window is going to pop open here asking if you want to create a new library from that document. And what it's going to do is it's going to import the character styles, the colors that are associated with uh, this document, layer styles, things like that. So you can easily access them from other desktop computers and mobile applications that are tied into your Adobe Creative Cloud user account. So I will choose here to create a library. And it has named that library after the file. And inside here, you can see that I have uh, color swatches, precise color swatches, uh, as well as character styles and font styles and layer styles. Now, what I want to do is I want to also create a library item of all of these layers in this group here. So I'm just going to drag that group from the layers panel right up there into the library. And it's called group one. I'm going to actually rename this group and I'm going to call it. Um, Winter Workshops blue, because the text is mainly blue. And let me actually make a copy of this now. So I'll just right click there and I'll choose duplicate. And in the, the duplicate, I'll call this white. And now I can actually close my original file here. So I'll just choose Command W to close that. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to, uh, on the one that I named Winter Workshops White, and if I mouse over that, I can see the little tooltip label. I'm going to open that up by double clicking on it, and it opens that up into a new file here. And I'm just going to change the text color. So I'll click on the bottom layer, and then I'll shift click on the top layer there. And then with the type tool active, I'll come up to the type color swatch, click on that, and then just choose white and click OK. So now this library item has been changed to where the text is white. I'll close that and choose to save that. And now let's uh, bring these into my pictures. I'll take the blue one and drag it 
on top of this photograph of an Icelandic winter landscape. And I'm going to hold down the shift key to scale it larger. And the shift key is just to constrain the proportions. Now this has come in as a smart object and a special type of smart object because you'll see that there's a little cloud icon down here in the corner of the layer thumbnail. That means it is linked to a library item that is associated with my Creative Cloud account, meaning that it would be available on other devices that uh, I am using with that same Creative Cloud ID. Let's go over here to the Aurora picture and we'll drag in there. Now, the presence of the bounding box with the X through it means that this is going to be a smart object. This is a place operation where we're placing it. I'm actually going to uh, press escape. If you want to bring the library item in and have it not be a smart object, you can just hold down the option key on Mac or the alt key on Windows and it'll come in just as the regular layers. And you can see here I have access to all my layers if I wanted to do it that way. But let me actually undo that. I do want to bring this in as a smart object. Again, I'm holding down the shift key to scale this larger. And we'll just put this here down like so. That looks pretty good. So what if I wanted to change something here? What if I decided, uh, well, this looks pretty good, but what would it look like here if uh, the word Iceland was in white? Well, all I have to do to change that is open up that library item again. And I can make that change. So let me highlight that text. We'll go change the color, make it white. And maybe what we'll do is put a small drop shadow onto that layer. I do have a drop shadow that is associated with the entire group. But I think I'm just going to drag it down just to the Iceland layer, just so it's on there. I will close that file, save it. And you can see that it updates here in the image. And that looks pretty good. Let me close this image. And I will choose to save that. And now let's modify that library item again with the image closed. Now, normally, of course, I could highlight the text and then come up here to the color picker for the type tool and change the color. But since I have that color already saved here, as part of the library for this file, I can just make sure that the layer is active and then just come up and click on the color swatch for that and it changes it. So very, very useful. I'm going to close that and I will save it. And now let's go back and open that file. We'll bring that in. So we don't see the change updated here because the file was closed when we made that change. But we do see a little alert symbol here down over the cloud icon on the library smart object, which tells us that there's been a change made. So it's not updating it right away, but it's alerting us and we can choose to update that if we want. I will right click on this layer here and I'll choose to update modified content. And now that update comes in. So libraries are very, very useful. There is a lot of other things you can do with it. This has just basically been, you know, scratching the tip of the proverbial iceberg. I will put a link in the show notes to a really good video by Adobe's Julianne Cost, which uh, goes into um, some of the new features and additional new features in a lot more detail. And you can check that out because definitely uh, could be a big time saver. Another new thing in this version of Photoshop is actually an old thing uh, that some people will probably be very glad is back, and that is the return of the oil paint filter. Now, obviously, if you are just into photography and not really interested in turning your photographs into oil paints, this is not going to be uh, anything too exciting, but uh, it is a pretty cool filter, and I've seen a lot of people do some really interesting work with it, so it definitely is cool to have it back. It's been gone now for uh, a couple of versions, I think. So where you find this is under the filter menu, down under stylize, and there you'll see oil paint, or you might see oil paint because you can only use this if your graphics card supports OpenCL. So if you see it dimmed down here, as, as I have in mine, the reason could be one of two things. One, either your graphics card does not support OpenCL or 
Uh, it does, but you just don't happen to have it turned on. So let's go and see where you would find that to turn it on. You have to go into the preferences under performance. And then under graphics processor setting here, you go into advanced settings. And then if you are able to use OpenCL, you will be able to check on this. However, on this particular computer, I cannot because this is an older computer. So I cannot use the oil paint filter on this particular computer. However, over on my other computer, if I go into my preferences and go into those advanced settings, I can see that I can turn OpenCL on. And once I do that, then I do have access to the oil paint filter. And one cool thing about this is that you can use it on a layer that you've turned into a smart object. And that is advantageous, of course, because that means that the oil paint filter uh, effects are going to be non-destructive and you can always go back and revisit them and change the settings in the filter dialog. Now, I'm not going to go into this filter here in this movie, but I will put a link in the show notes to a video by Howard Pinsky that explains it really well. I've got some nice Aurora Borealis oil paint action going on in this image. That's a first for me. Okay, one final tip to pass along, or improvement rather, in, in the new version of Photoshop, and that is that you can now drag multiple layers from one document to another using the uh, tabbed view here. So you've always been able to take a single layer and drag this up to a tab of another image, drag down into the image and copy it over. And of course it's copying over also the blend mode properties of, of what that layer was set to in the previous image. But now you can select multiple layers here. So I'll just hold down the command key and select a bunch of different layers to bring in. So I've got four layers selected there. Actually, I've got five layers selected. I'll get my move tool here and I'll just drag up to the name tab of the other file, come down in and drop it. And there we have it. Very, very cool and very, very useful. And uh, if you are uh, somebody who does compositing uh, or even just works with, uh, you know, common sort of text and graphic elements, maybe that you're moving back and forth uh, between promotional pieces or products that you're creating for yourself. This is a really, really useful shortcut. Definitely glad to see that here in the latest version of Photoshop. So there you have it, a sampling of some of my favorite new features and improvements in the latest Photoshop release, the 2015.1 update, which came out on December 1st. And that's not all that's in there. There are there are some other things, of course, but I was concentrating mainly on uh, the photography related features, just because this is, of course, a photography related podcast. But there are some other interesting uh, new features and improvements in the release, uh, particularly in how you work with fonts, uh, as well as working with artboards. And if you're interested in that, I will put some links to additional videos in the show notes. Uh, for you to peruse at your leisure to see if that's uh, something you are interested in. And uh, the release also includes a long list of what Adobe calls JDI improvements. And JDI stands for Just Do It. So uh, they aren't really huge new features. They're just usually simple little tweaks and improvements and refinements to existing features. But sometimes they can actually be quite significant uh, if they... Um, kind of really improve and smooth out a feature that you use on a day in and day out basis. Again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Well, that is the episode for this week. Uh, thank you for watching as always. Uh, remember that you can always uh, tune in to the audio version of The Fix on iTunes, and you can also find an audio version as well as the video version on the website, thisweekinphoto.com slash thefix. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time on The Fix.